Code Emotion. My name is Arun Gupta and I work for Oracle and I'm here to talk about uh, WebSocket and Server Sent event. Um, and my goal would be you know, in this quick 40 minutes, kind of give you a quick overview of what WebSocket and Server Sent events are, how the two are different, and hopefully show some code examples as well on how we can actually build a standard based application using both of these. Okay? So as I said, you know, a quick WebSocket primer, um, then a code sample for it, same thing, you know, server sent event primer and a code sample for it and how it's the, the features for that are available in the Java platform. Now, HTTP by nature itself is half duplex in the sense that client makes a request to server, then server understands the request, then makes a response back. So at a given point of time, client can send to a server or server can send to a client. The protocol is well established in the sense it's request response. Or even if it's one way, then you send a request, still get a response back as HTTP 201. And it's very chatty protocol in the sense when you are sending a request from client to server, there are a chock full of headers that you need to send as part of the request. To, as a user, it's not visible to us, um, but if essentially the browser or the client is sending a whole bunch of headers that goes as part of the request. Same thing as part of the response. response. The crux of the message really goes as the HTTP payload. Um, and that's sort of what is useful to us. You know, we don't care what headers are going over the wire. That's HTTP's problem, not ours. So what that makes it difficult is very challenging for using HTTP for any real-time communication because there's so much overhead of the protocol. So people worked around those problems using Comet, polling, long polling, with different programming models, with different APIs, and they have essentially all been hacks so far in terms of how they're gonna look like. So that's exactly where WebSocket come into the picture. It says, hey, you know what? We're gonna provide a full duplex, two-way, bi-directional communication channel over a single TCP. Um, unlike HTTP, where every time you want to make a request, a new TCP is set up, a new HTTP is set up, and all that you know, connection negotiation has to happen with WebSocket. It's a single TCP connection. Your existing HTTP gets upgraded to WebSocket, and there are standard mechanisms defined for that. And then there onwards, in, on that single TCP connection, no tear down, you can, the client and the server, they're full duplex in the sense, client can send as many requests to server, and similarly, server can send as many requests, not really responses. Server can send as many requests to client. And these are essentially bi-directional, in the sense client can send to server, server can send to client any point of time. Any design pattern, even request response, you have to build on top of that basic primitive of one-way request that is going from client to server or server to client. So that is sort of the basic premise of it. Now, when people talk about WebSocket, they're really talking about two things. You know, first is the protocol, which is RFC 6445. So Google for it, you'll find it. You know, it's an IETF standard. Um, it defines exactly how the wiring or the framing of the protocol is gonna look like. That means on the wire, how the protocol is gonna look like. And then the second part that people talk about WebSocket is the JavaScript API, which is defined by W3C. Um, now, if you're using WebSockets from browser, of course, JavaScript is sort of the lingua franca over there. So in that case, you've got to have a WebSocket API that is defined by W3C, and then the browsers need to support that API. So how does the whole thing look like in terms of you know, connection establishment? Well, there's a client, there's a server. You know, they are trying to connect using normal HTTP methods. So in that sense, a you know, client makes a HTTP request to the server. The first request, as you can see over here, is just a normal HTTP request. You know, the important headers to recognize over here is upgrade and connection. Now, those are standard HTTP headers. You know, HTTP defines an upgrade mechanism by which you can upgrade an HTTP connection to a newer version of HTTP. They happen to be using this for WebSocket. So it's a standard HTTP header saying upgrade the connection and upgrade to WebSocket. And then there are a bunch of other headers as well for security, origin check, and things like that. We won't get into the details. But those are the two important headers. So you're making a HTTP GET request using HTTP 1.1, and that is the URI that you are making a request to. 
Now this is over the TCP connection with HTTP. If the server does understand it's a WebSocket endpoint, which is slash chat effectively, then you're saying the server will respond back, oh, you know what? I'm going to upgrade the connection. I'm going to upgrade it to WebSocket. Again, those are very standard headers defined by the HTTP specification. And then it's saying, oh, I am switching the protocol from HTTP to WebSocket. Then onwards, it's no longer HTTP. It's a single TCP connection. Same TCP connection is now WebSocket. Uh, anything that you send on it is your application specific. And the beauty of WebSocket really is it's a very lean protocol. You know, I mean, I'm a runner, so I enjoy the being lean part of it, and that's what makes it more efficient. So it can go in a long run. In a sense, the amount of framing required, you know, unlike HTTP where you have to do a lot of framing in terms of headers and body and payload, etc. Here, the framing is pretty minimal, literally two bytes of overhead. Everything else is the payload. <coughs> so let's see. <coughs> now, a client makes a HTTP request saying, I want to go to a handshake request. <coughs> then you get a handshake response back. At that point of time, the client and server are really connected. The important part to realize is, once the client and server are connected, they're purely client and server from the perspective of who's receiving the request and who's initiating the request. But once they're connected, that's it. Actually, there are some seats up here in case you guys want to come over here. So once the client and server are connected, they're actually all pairs. So now the peers can communicate with each other. They both have equal capabilities. They can send a message at any point of time. They can initiate the termination, all of that. <clears throat> so how does this work? Then, well, there are callback handlers defined on both the sides on the peer one, let's say the client peer and the server peer. Once you know, they both call open, you know, the client peer sends a message, you know, one message, two message, three message. Notice the server is not responding back. There is no request response design pattern. Your application has to build that design pattern on top of this basic primitive. The server may say, oh, you know what? I got received three messages. That's my design pattern. Now I'm going to send a so-called response or you know, a message back to my client. It may say, you know what, I received uh, data from client and I didn't like it, so there's an error here, uh, either parsing the error or communication error, and there are callback handlers defined for that. Then more messages, eventually you know, the client peer says, oh, you know what, I'm gonna terminate the connection. The server peer could have easily initiated that termination as well. At that point of time, they, the connection is terminated. So that's sort of the basic uh, message flow that happens between the client and the server and if eventually peers. <clears throat> now, this is a quick overview of you know, what the W3C API looks like. It's, it, it is still a W3C candidate recommendation. Now, that's one of the W3C technical jargons. That means it's not a standard yet, but it's sort of still the de facto standard, used pretty heavily already. In here, for example, you can say, I'm going to define a WebSocket. That is the URL where my WebSocket endpoint is going to connect to. Um, there are uh, certain state elements over here. These are my callback handlers. For example, we were talking about on open, on error, on close. Um, <clears throat> WebSocket has this concept of extensions and sub protocol that allow the WebSocket protocol to be extended. For example, you can use uh, multiplexing you know, or uh, compression. Those are sort of some of the common extensions, but extensions by itself is a pretty niche topic at this point of time. <clears throat> now, these are the methods by which you can actually send uh, data from client to server. I mean, this is, remember, this is a JavaScript API, so it's primarily used you know, in the browser environment. So think about the client perspective. So this is where you're using you know, your send messages. There are four send messages. And JavaScript has a binary data type, so you could send blob or array buffer, which is a native binary type for JavaScript. You can send that data as part of this API. So you can say, send either text data or the bunch of binary types over here. So WebSocket can handle both text and binary data. How many of you use Internet Explorer as your primary browser? Okay, excellent, that's what I love to see, nobody. <laughs> And don't be ashamed if you're using it. You know? Well, the reason I ask that is, up until recently, 
you know, IE had no WebSocket support. And IE 10, you know, they have just added support literally like late last year. And I have not tried it myself. So I've only heard rumors that they have <laughs> WebSocket support. But otherwise, other than IE, all modern browsers, you know, excluding IE, have um, support for WebSocket. And that's what I meant by saying that the WebSocket support needs to be part of the browser itself. It's not a JavaScript that you can put as part of your application. Oh, I, I understand WebSocket. I'm going to write my WebSocket.js, bundle it my application. No, no. <clears throat> because there's a JavaScript part is one part of it. The protocol is the important part of it. You know, how on the wire message exchange is going to happen, how those callback handlers is going to be invoked. So that all that concept has got to be baked into your browser. So you can go to this website, caniuse.com slash websockets. And that website will give you an idea of you know, where your favorite browser is. Pretty much all the modern browsers, and I fail to understand why the native Android browser does not support WebSocket, again. Um, but otherwise, all the modern browsers now support um, WebSocket. <clears throat> so I was wondering, you know, what is it that WebSocket is such a big deal about? So yeah, I mean, I understand you know, there are a few bunch of headers going back and forth between REST which don't go as part of WebSocket. So I did some internal benchmarking for myself. And so what I did is I wrote a REST endpoint, just an echo endpoint, and a similarly a WebSocket endpoint. And then um, these are like my HTML5 progress bars. So I send messages and I receive messages, just a plain echo, OK? Nothing fancy over there. Then I said, OK, I'm going to send 10 messages of one byte, just a byte. And same thing I'm going to do for WebSocket as well. And then I'm going to start comparing the numbers. So if you look at it, 10 messages of one byte uh, REST endpoint, just a pure REST endpoint, just GET, OK, is 200. Well, this is not a GET. This is a POST, actually, because you're actually sending data and getting back as well. So this is 220 milliseconds. This is about 7 milliseconds, OK? And that's 10 messages, comparable, barely noticeable. Let's increase the payload. So 100 messages, 10 bytes. So we're bumping up by 10x over here. About a second, and this is still 57 millisecond, you know, way down there. Let's bump up the load again. And now, again, 10x. So 100,000 messages and 100 bytes. So this is about 10 seconds, and this is still about two millis I mean, 200 milliseconds, way down under you know, uh, one second. This is where the significant difference is. You know, we're sending like 5K messages of 1,000 byte each, one kilobyte each. This is about like 55 seconds, and here is about 1.2 seconds. So, that's where the importance of WebSocket is for real-time communication. Because the, uh, the framing is so lean, it is a much better protocol for real-time communication. You know, you can send quick spurts of data, like you know, if you want to send a JSON. You're not sending like a 50K of JSON. You know, that's not a good design programming. You know? um, so if you're sending like one kilobyte of JSON, which is a very typical payload, Think about it, you know, if you're sending 5K messages, it is pretty scalable that way. Now, something else that I'm going to do beyond this is, this is one client sending multiple data to the same endpoint. What I want to take a look at is, how about if I say, you know, like, you know, simulate like 100 clients. How does that work out? How does that kind of uh, take into consideration? But this is at least a basic data point for us. You know, this is a baseline, and then we can work upon that. So let's take a look at how we are building that support in the Java platform. Now, JSR 356, um, that's how we build specifications in the Java land. JSR 356 is a specific number where we are adding support for doing WebSocket-driven development. Um, and in that, we are defining annotations. For example, on any POJO, you can put a at server endpoint annotation, and that will become a WebSocket endpoint. Um, well, we'll take, a, take a look at that. Uh, not just annotation driven, we have an interface driven approach as well. So you can say, you know what, implements this interface and it gives you a little bit more tighter control over what kind of messages and how you want to deal with the life cycle and all those things as well. Okay? We of course have a client endpoint as well. Now, remember, W3C defines a JavaScript API, but there is no corresponding client aspect of it. And that's exactly what the JSR 356 is going to define. So, Let's take a look at quick samples, and then I'll show you something uh, live as well. So very canonical, hello world, H how does it look? Well, hello bean, string, say hello, take this parameter, return string. 
Pojo, right? Nothing fancy over there. How do I convert this to a WebSocket endpoint? Just add add server endpoint. Single class, one annotation, boom, that's it. No deployment descriptors, no other you know, fancy um, annotations required, just one annotation. Well, this is a WebSocket endpoint. You know, a message is being received. Which business method you want to call? You put on add on message on that, okay? So that means this is the method that you want to invoke whenever the method is being, whenever the WebSocket endpoint is being invoked. The payload is automatically mapped to my very first parameter over here, which in this case comes out to name. In this case, I am specifically designing a, a request response design pattern in the sense, oh, this is my request and this is my response going as a return. I could very well make it as wide as well, in which case, this is just receiving requests. I'm just sucking up the request from the client. I may respond back whenever I want to, in which case I go with the, you know, there are other design patterns in the WebSocket API which would let you say, oh, for example, here I could say comma session that gives me the client which is actually making the request. So let's say I can say, you know, I'm gonna receive five requests, then to the session I'll say send the request back or send the message back. The bunch of annotations here. Um, this is what turns the POJO into a WebSocket endpoint. This is when POJO wants to act as a client endpoint. And again, I'm talking the terminology client endpoint. You know, we have uh, regular callback handlers here uh, on message, and we can have the variable URI path parameters as well. Now, as I said, WebSocket sends text data and binary data. That is good. but <coughs> Excuse me. If you're receiving JSON data every time, <clears throat> it's gonna be tricky because that means you're receiving the JSON data, then you somehow have to convert it into POJO and then act upon it. You don't wanna act upon maybe JSON raw data as is. Or if you're getting a binary data, you may wanna receive it as a Java AWT image or something like that, or some of your own binary data, binary format, or your own POJO. So that's exactly the concept of encoders and decoders. WebSocket API defines how you can define encoding from text and binary to your POJO and vice versa, from your POJOs to text slash binary. You can define, I mean, the idea is to follow the dry pattern here, don't repeat yourself. You define those encoders and decoders once and then you specify them as part of the annotation. How does it work? So for example, <clears throat> I have, a, I mean, I just use the same class here because it's eventually in, in implementing interfaces, but I could have my message encoder, my message decoder. I have two separate classes where I'm doing the encoding and decoding, and I can specify them on my POJO, and that'll just work out of the box, okay? And I'll show samples for this. How does my encoder and decoder look like? Well, in this case, um, all I'm doing is, I say my message implements decoder.text. Yeah, this is messy. Deco it should be decoder.text and encoder.text. This is implementing both decoder and encoder as well. <laughs> so uh, these two methods, decode and will decode, comes from decoder basically. It's saying, oh, I'm looking at my string data. Can I decode this message? So then you return true. And if you return true, then that particular decoder gets picked up. And then eventually in decode, you're decoding it. And here, what I'm using is standard JSON API. That's yet another feature we have added in the Java E7 platform, standard JSON processing API. So I'm saying, JSON, give me a reader. This is a DOM reader. From the string reader, give me the string, which is what the inbound payload is. Grab the payload, read the object, and give me JSON object here. Similarly, in encode, I take my message, which is basically my JSON object, and then I say, convert it into a string. So POJO to string, string to POJO. This is my uh, string uh, or text-based encoding decoding. I could do the same for binary as well. And in that case, um, the messages, the interfaces are different. So decoder.binary, encoder.binary, and instead of string, I'm taking and returning byte arrays. Okay, I'm gonna show you a quick sample. So let me show you the sample first, then I'll try to explain through it. Yeah. 
So <clears throat> this is a collaborative whiteboard that I built using simple HTML5 canvas. I can pick the color shape and then I can say, okay, I'm in an online mode. So keep transferring the data as I'm doing it on my whiteboard here, okay? So you'll see the changes here. So I say, okay, red square, as I'm clicking it, now make it a blue square, change the circle, you know, or color as well, and play around with it. Everything gets transferred to me as is. Now I'm saying, you know what, I'm not in online mode anymore. I'm going offline, and I'm gonna do some processing of the data. So let's say add some more values here. Oh, sorry, back here. I'm gonna add some more data here, no more transfer. Now let's say a new player joins the game. Now let's think about this as a game, for example. Now let's say a new player joins in. So I'm gonna go here. A new player is joining in, okay? So, uh, uh, actually here. And then I'm gonna say, okay, how do I make sure that the data is being transmitted to the new player? So I say, send the snapshot. So when I click on snapshot, so you'll see this is, so this is Chrome, this is Firefox, and this is Safari, three different browsers. This could be on three separate machines all together, perfectly fine. So now the data is all replicated in all three browsers. Now the key part that I want to highlight through this demo is, when I'm clicking on the browser over here, okay, what's really happening is I'm clicking here, is grabbing the JSON coordinates, is sending the JSON coordinates to all the listening endpoint or the listening clients for me. The client gets the JSON coordinate, refreshes itself. That's it. You know, it says, okay, hey, in the JSON I'm saying, what are my, well, I'm sending JSON structure. In the JSON structure, I'm sending the X and Y coordinate and I'm so saying what shape and what color. Based upon that, I just draw on my local client. Now when I'm saying send a snapshot, then I'm doing a binary data transfer. I'm saying capturing the binary data and say send the data. Let's take a look at the code now. Now, my, this is my simple websocket.js that I have created, and it's pretty straightforward. I'm saying, okay, connect to the WebSocket endpoint. WebSocket, instead of HTTP, connects with WS colon slash slash. That's the protocol that you need to use. You start with that protocol, the upgrade automatically happens for you. You know, you don't need to do anything. I mean, I just explained that concept that is done by the underlying container for you. So you're saying, okay, connect to this endpoint, which is where my endpoint is listening. I'm creating a new WebSocket. And if I'm doing the binary data transfer, it's gonna be array buffer type. And then I'm defining my handlers. So whenever message, message is received, call this on message, or whenever error is received, call this message, okay? And then I have my simple text and send binary, just to kind of put different console.logs. And here I'm saying websocket.sendjson and send bytes, okay? So that's that. In terms of my WebSocket endpoint, that's again pretty simple. I have add server endpoint. I'm saying this is the URI where my endpoint is being listening. These are my encoders and decoders. So if we take a look at the encoder, for example, it's saying encoder.text. So it's basically returning a figure element for me. It's taking a figure. Now remember, it's encoding. So it's encoding a figure to a string. It takes an encode, figure, returns a string. And then I can go back to my figure decoder, for example. Now the decoder is taking a string and converting it into a figure. So here I'm saying, okay, um, take a string, create a JSON object, return it back you know, as a figure. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, something else that maybe we can take a look at is, um, well, this is all application code here. Uh, yeah, uh, if we take a look at the figure class, <clears throat> figure.java is pretty straightforward. All I have is a JSON object over here, you know, just getters and setters over there. And coordinates again, very simple, just float x and float y. Now, one thing that you may wanna look at is here. 
Now, this is what I'm showing you is a Google developer <coughs> uh, tools. This is sort of the JSON structure that is being received. Now, remember, I was clicking in the Safari browser. The data was being received for me in the Chromes. So here in the Chrome, I'm saying, for example, in the JSON structure, I'm getting shape, square, color is whatever this R, red, color, square, and these are the coordinates. These are the coordinates that are being received by my browsers, all my listening browsers, which then just, you know, draw the whatever shape in the right coordinates. <clears throat> Something else that might be useful for you is like WebSockets, uh, the traffic can be observed natively in Chrome developer tools. For example, well, let's take a look at it quickly. So here, for example, I can go to network. I can say, show me the web sockets. Well, I need to refresh the page so it won't show it otherwise. But what you have is a data here. You know, it kind of, it kind of shows you a snapshot. So in, well, this is Wireshark, actually. And Wireshark is what used to be ethereal. And this is just like, like a network sniffer. So it's going to show you the entire stream of packets literally on the wire message. You can take it as is, and it's going to show you the entire stream, how it's, how it's looking like. So you can follow a TCP stream or a HTTP stream. It's showing you what the messages are you know, and what the more details are. This, on the other hand, is a snapshot from Chrome. For example, you can see how the live WebSocket packets or frames, which is the WebSocket terminology, can be tracked. Okay? And I'll, I'll share the slides, guys. So by all means, I'm all for sharing. Switching gears, server sentiment. So WebSocket, you know, WebSocket is sort of the pampered child, so to say. Um, although server sentiment is older, but WebSocket is because of the two-way nature, you know, of being so efficient, has always gotten more love. Server sentiment, on the other hand, you know, is part of HTML5 specification, but is primarily, well, it is only server push. In the sense, if you don't care about two-way communication, all you want is the data from server pushing, like you know, a stock ticker or something like that, or you're a passive Facebook reader, I, want, I just want to get a feed. I don't care about posting anything. <laughs> so you can do things like that. Same thing, you know, there's a JavaScript API. You know, on the client side, you are listening using event source API, and then you can define your message callbacks. And I'll do a comparison between WebSocket and server sent event as well. Similar API, you know, this is again defined by W3C. So for example, you can say, I'm going to create my what is the event source uh, URL that I'm listening to? So somebody on the server is basically pushing out events that you're listening to. You got some states here. You got your regular callback handlers. And there is no sending from this side because that part is handled by WebSockets. So let's take a look at you know, a server sent events example. Now, how does that look like? So in this case, I'm saying, um, oh, this is the URL that I'm listening to. Now remember, this is on the client side, so there's no cross-site scripting that is possible here. So you have to say just web resources, items, events. I'm just listening to a REST endpoint, which is going to publish a bunch of events to me that I'm listening. So here I'm saying, oh, this is the event source. This is a standard JavaScript API, um, and pretty much supported across the, bro across the board by all the browsers. So you can say, this is the URL I'm listening, and this is the event source API. Then in here, I'm saying on message, which is my standard callback handler, I'm going to listen the message. Whatever event comes out, I'm just going to log it. Log.data, very standard one, OK? And here, slightly different from server uh, WebSocket is you can have your custom message handlers. For example, in WebSocket, you can only have, for example, on message. That's it. That is the only event handler that you have. Here, I'm defining my custom event listener, say size. So for example, somebody from the server is spitting out data as size, you know, as that is the event that they're spitting out, then you can listen for size. So you can do a little bit more sophisticated programming in this case. Now that's the client side. On the server side, how does it look like? Well, on the server side, of course, you know, we have to have, uh, by the way, this, this slide that I'm talking about here is Jersey specific. Um, now Jersey is a reference implementation of JAX RS, or Java API for RESTful web service. Um, and the reason is still only in Jersey and not in JAX RS at this point of time is 
because HTML5 will hopefully, hopefully be a specification in 2014. We cannot include non-final specifications in a final JSR. So that's the reason this feature is incorporated in Jersey. Hopefully when HTML5 goes final, server sentiment goes final with that, we'll incorporate that as a standard in standard JAX RS as well. Until then, we have you know, this feature and support available in Jersey. So what we're doing is, we're saying, oh, this is a server sent event broadcaster. I'm gonna create a broadcaster, and I'm gonna spit out a bunch of events. And in this case, all I'm doing is, um, think of this as a REST endpoint. In the REST endpoint, I'm saying this is the path where I'm listening for all the events, and I'm gonna produce a whole bunch of server sent event. Again, remember this, this is, a sta this is Jersey specific. I'm quoting that again. Um, and here I'm saying is, okay, you know, I'm gonna, to the broadcaster, I'm gonna send the event. So this is what the broadcaster is gonna spit out. So you're saying, okay, event output is the kind of event that I'm gonna spit out. Now, you have subscribed to the URL, and broadcaster is what you're listening at. So then what you say is, <clears throat> let's say you have a method uh, in your REST endpoint, and I'll, I'll show a live sample of this as well. Uh, where you say, okay, add fruit or add an item, okay? So, now let's say I'm submitting it using a HTML form. So once you say add fruit using add form param, you can just grab the value from the HTML form. You get the value in here. Then you can say, oh, fruits dot add fruit. Oh, no, that fruits may be my database, whatever it is. You know, I'm just adding it to my REST business logic. Now this is where my server sent event comes in. In the server sent event here I'm saying is, oh, broadcast a new event. And in this case, I'm saying, okay, use the builder API. This is a type of the type string, and this is the value that I want to broadcast. That means fruit is the actual fruit that is being added. I'm broadcasting that as an event. Now remember, somebody else may be updating your, maybe calling your REST endpoint, and somebody else may be listening to your events. In this case, it happens to be the same, so don't get confused in that sense. You know, somebody else may be pumping your data and somebody else may be listening to the data over there. Think of a stock ticker example. So this is one event where I'm pumping out data, which is where my on message on the client side is gonna get called. And here is where I'm spitting out a specific data, you know, a specific event by the name size. So I'm listening to it on the client side. So let's see a sample of this. <clears throat> So all I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna add some elements here. So if I add AA, just a random name here, oh, I mean, it's not a fruit really, but <laughs> but you add a fruit here, let's add a fruit actually. Well, never mind, too late. So <laughs> if you're adding AA, for example, here, that's how I've been using my test data. That's what comes to my mind. So when you add AA, so this is, remember, this is my custom message that I'm receiving on the client side with the size. And this is my standard on message that I was talking about. So now let's add a real fruit. Apple. And here, again, you know, I received the custom message and the standard message. So all of that is possible. <clears throat> so let's, okay. Let's kind of compare and contrast, you know, your um, server sent event and WebSockets, which is sort of the last part of the presentation anyway. So <clears throat> let's take a look. WebSocket, as I said, is over a custom protocol in the sense, you know, from HTTP you upgrade to WebSocket, yes, but then it's a new protocol altogether. It's no longer HTTP. Here it's over simple HTTP. You know, you're just using HTTP and it works out of the box. And I'm not listing them in order of pros and cons, I'm just kind of comparing and contrasting at this point of time. WebSocket is full duplex, that means server to client, client to server, and bi-directional, that means both the directions it works. Here is server push only. The issue with that is when you are doing, if you want to do client to server, that is out of band. You may use XML HTTP request, 
but that's completely out of band. You, your application defines that protocol, and then there is overhead of creating TCP, HTTP, all that crap. WebSocket, as I said, native support in most browsers, in modern browsers at least. But here, for example, if you want server sent event, you can actually polyfill it. You know, you can create your own server sent event.js and put it as part of the browser, and that'll work. That's not the case with WebSocket because it's a protocol level thing right there itself. It's very simple, simple protocol. So for server push, if that is your only requirement, bingo, you don't need to go anywhere else. It's not straightforward protocols. If you take a look at RFC 6445, you'll realize it's kind of complex, but it's, that complexity is hidden in day-to-day -day use for you by the browsers. <clears throat> As I said, in WebSocket, we have predefined message handlers. Here you can define your custom message handler. We took a look at an example of a size, for example. Um, in terms of WebSocket, what is the application specific? Oh, uh, design patterns. So you, des you design your application patterns, request response or whatever that pub, sub, all those protocols you define on top of WebSocket. Here, there is built-in support for, uh, sorry, too bad, I'm different topic actually. So here, there is built-in support for reconnection and event ID. In the sense, um, if a server sent event connection is established and that times out, it automatically reconnects after 30 seconds and that's configurable. Here, if the connection is lost, it's lost. You have to start brand new HTTP and then you have to build uh, all of that logic as part of your application. Now, as I said, this is a custom protocol. So proxy servers, caching servers, DNS servers are still catching up. They may need some configuration. This is over HTTP, so it just works out of the box. Uh, here, binary and text both is supported. There is no support for binary types here. Last but not the least, all the resources for you. So Java API for WebSocket. This is uh, JSR 356, part of Java E7, integrated in GlassFish. Same thing with server sent event. Not part of Java E7, but integrated in GlassFish. <coughs> Excuse me. Questions? I'm sorry, this is a really fast-paced session for that early in the morning. So WebSocket is not integrated in GRC, it's not part of GRC? It's a separate specification, separate implement. Uh, the question is, is WebSocket not integrated in Jersey? So WebSocket is not part of Jersey by design because WebSocket is a separate specification and implementation, but they work very well with each other. WebSocket, from your perspective, what you're looking at is GlassFish. GlassFish is the delivery vehicle for Java E7. WebSocket, Jersey, server sent event, they're all integrated in GlassFish for you. What's not integrated in Java E7 is server sent event. As I said, because server sent event is not a final specification yet. Two questions, actually. Um, what kind of server were you using for the signal? Uh, I'm using GlassFish 4 build 78, which is about two weeks old. Build 80 is available, so that should just work. Oh, it's yeah. already available? Absolutely. Okay, and the other one was, uh, were, were you using on the demo uh, different browsers because you were using the session or in a way that uh, you couldn't connect to the same browser, you know, the, the, the bigger, the bigger you know. Right, the question was why, why, why was I using different browsers? I just wanted to show the highlight that, you know, these three browsers, they support WebSocket, one part of it. Second part of it is... Was it possible in your demo to use the same browser oh, yeah. with different windows? Yeah, different tabs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a good question. What about security? So in WebSocket, you can do WS colon slash slash. Uh, that is your standard text-based protocol. If you want to be a secure protocol, then you can say WSS, which is just like HTTPS. So you have a secure pipeline, and then you push data on that. I've been shown a signal. That's the end of the talk. If you have any more questions, I'm going to be out in the hallway. Thank you. Code Emotion.